comes from 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. It's our passage we're going to be listening to this morning. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded for prayer. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, since love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the varied grace of God. If anyone speaks, let it be of one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, let it be the strength God provides, so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him be glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Father, as the author and creator of all things, we know that all blessing and goodness originates from you and your will. We cry out for blessing of rain, of health, and of righteousness to fall upon our world. Peter said thousands of years ago that the end of all things is near, and we're repeating those words today. We ask that you watch over our firefighters and first responders answering the call to serve and to rescue in Washington, Oregon, and California. Cover and secure the fire evacuees from harm and danger that they may find hope in you. For may you be glorified through Jesus in everything, because to you belongs all glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Patrick, you may be seated. Welcome. Isn't this weird having so many people in this room? It's more fun. Hey, if you brought your Bible, you can turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. We have made it to chapter 4. And what I want to do is really quickly, for time's sake, and because I know some of you are wrestling with uh, little squirrely kids, and, uh, and that's great. Again, we, lo- we love them. We love having them learn about adult worship, being in here with us. Uh, but I'm just going to kind of rock and roll. So if you have your Bible, 1 Peter chapter 4. Now, I'm sorry, we were playing an outdoor service. We don't have notes for the screen, but let me tell you, uh, if you want to, a little bit later, if you miss anything today because of maybe some of our noisier members, um, you could go online. We post the sermons later, and you will find us at, uh, probably by Tuesday afternoon, uh, just my sermon notes. You can download it and uh, just stick it in a file. So we're going to jump right in here. Chapter 1, verses uh, 1 through 6, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, he says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same understanding. Because the one who suffers in the flesh, he is finished with sin. In order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desires, but for God's will. For there uh, has already been enough time, enough time spent in doing what the Gentiles choose to do, carrying on in unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, uh, orgies, carousing, and lawless idolatry. He says, they are surprised that you don't join them in the same flood of wild living, and they slander you because of that. They, they will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was also preached to those who are now dead, so that although they might be judged in the flesh according to human standards, they might also live in the spirit according to God's standards. We live in a fallen world that is only a shadow of the new creation that is coming. You think of your worst day, you think of the worst situation going on in the world. I think of these horrific fires in the West and we pray for our neighbors. We pray for them. We pray for their governments. We pray for the people. We pray uh, for rain. You know, we just pray for no wind. We pray for those folks. But you think of the worst situation going on in the world. You think of the most beautiful, amazing situation that's going on in the world. And the world today is a mere shadow of the world that is coming the new creation that is coming. And so he says, therefore, since this is all happening, he says, since Christ suffered once in the flesh, he says, Christ suffered one time for sins in the flesh. You and I have been baptized into Christ's death. We have been raised to life in the spirit, resurrected to life. He says, now arm yourselves with this understanding. Why? So that you don't get sucked into the world's way of thinking. So Christ has suffered once in the body for sins. We are baptized into Christ, raised to life in the spirit. And now we arm ourselves with this understanding. How do we do that? How do we do that? Here's what he says. He says, uh, one, understand that we live in the end times. Understand that you live at the end of the world. 
Do you think about your life that way? Do you think about your life in such a way that you think, oh, I'm living in the end times? I know some of you have some pretty circuitous, very complex theories of the end times and how things are going to work out. God bless you. I'm glad you do. But let me tell you this. I'm very glad that you're watchful. I'm very glad that you're alert. I'm very glad that you're studying it out and you're trying to seek the times and the circumstances in which Christ in you is pointed because that's what the prophets did according to 1 Peter 1.11. So great, I'm glad. But you and I need to know that we are living in the last days. We are living at the end of the world. Famine, plague, swarms of locusts, crashed economies, a world on fire, rumors of impending war, asteroids passing by earth too close for comfort. About six months ago, I would have found these words or these phrases in Matthew 24, Luke 21, or Revelation chapter 16 through 18, but I didn't find any of those words there. I found them all in news headlines. Here's what you need to know. You and I live in a time that is characterized where it just feels like the world is about to fly apart at the seams. It feels like the world is about to come apart, and I, I don't have to tell you that. You already know that. So are we in the end times? Yes, we are. How long have we been in the end times? Since the day of Pentecost, for 2,000 years. God poured his Holy Spirit out on the church, and here's what happened. They go out into the street, and they are speaking in tongues. And all of these visitors, probably half a million visitors are there. And many of these people have crowded around the disciples. This is 9 o'clock in the morning now. They have been in a prayer vigil all night. God has poured his Holy Spirit out on these people. They come out speaking in these other languages. And these are the languages that these Jews have, are, are from the states that they are visiting from in Rome. And they say, we hear them speaking in our native languages. And then some people said, they're definitely drunk. They've definitely been, you know, they're half lit. And so then Peter has to stand up. This is what Peter does. Peter has to stand up and say, no, 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 we're not drunk. It's 9 a.m. Who gets drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning? Right? Bars aren't even open. L listen, we're not inebriated. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. And this, what you see and hear, is that. This is that. That was spoken of through the prophet Joel. That in the last days, God would pour out his spirit on old men, on young men, on old women, on young women. God would pour his spirit out on us. And this, what you see and what you hear is that. So we have been living in the last days since the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church on the day of Pentecost. Since then. And this is why, decades later, when he's writing the last, one of the last books he's ever going to write, he tells the church, the end of all things is near. He says, the end of all things is near. Now, both Paul and Peter believed they would see Jesus return in their lifetime. And they were wrong. He didn't. They didn't get the content of their beliefs wrong. They just got the timing wrong. They were wrong. Every generation since then has believed that Christ is returning in their lifetime. And they've all been wrong. You and I believe that Christ is probably going to return within our lifetime. I believe that. I really believe that. I think I'm 97.5% sure. I really am. And we might be wrong. But just because they were wrong, and just because every generation of Christians have been wrong, doesn't mean that every generation of Christians in the future will be wrong. One generation is going to be right. <laughs> okay. And if that's us, if this is the last cycle of the earth around the sun, praise God. Amen. Praise God. Bring it. I'm waiting for Jesus to come and claim his kingdom and dash the nations to like pottery with an iron rod. That's Psalm chapter 2, right? I'm ready for that. I'm ready for Jesus to come and bring us resurrected bodies and bring us into the kingdom forever and establish his kingdom forever and ever. And of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. Man, I'm ready. But listen. Listen. And there might be a lot of life that we would have missed out on, but it, will, it is nothing. It is a shadow compared to the life that we will have in resurrection and the new creation. So I'm ready, but I might be wrong. But some generation is going to be right. And, and Peter says this, live with this mindset as if you are in the end times. Live in, with this mindset as if you are in the last days. 
In the meantime, what kind of behavior should characterize the disciple? He tells us right here. What kind of character, what kind of character should define the faithful in Christ until he returns in all of his glory? He says, be alert. Be alert. Now, the word for alert, alertness is the Greek word sophroneo. And it means the quality of being prudent or awake. Okay? The quality of being prudent or awake. Are you a woke Christian? Yeah, on Resurrection Day, you will be. <laughs> You're the real one. You're the real kind. Because you believe in the gospel, and you have been awakened, enlightened to the truth of the gospel. And, and, and Peter says this, be alert. Be up. Have your eyes open. Have your spir spiritual radar on. Be alert. He says, be sober-minded in prayer. Be sober-minded in prayer. The word for sober-minded means free of mental drunkenness. That's what it means, to be free of mental drunkenness. Now, I know some of you have a past, and you know what it's like to be a mental drunk. And it's not just that your body is inebriated and taken over by the poison of alcohol. It's also the fact that your, your mind has just become foggy. Isn't that right? <laughs> I'm, I'm asking Daniel. He's the expert. Look, if you have ever heard Daniel, Pastor Daniel's testimony, he, he could tell you what it's like. He could tell you what it's like to walk around in a haze and a fog and confusion. This is what the devil brings. And what he says here, he uses that as an illustration of our spiritual condition. He says, be mentally alert. Don't be mentally inebriated, drunk. Be alert in prayer, in prayer. He says, be relentless in your love for one another. He says, maintain constant love for each other. First of all, constant love for another has to be maintained. If you have a good marriage, I'm going to tell you why. Because you maintain constant love for your spouse. If you have a bad marriage, I'm going to tell you why. This is Pastor Jeff's counseling. <laughs> this is it. This is all I know. You haven't maintained your passion. You haven't maintained the passion that you had on your wedding day when you said those vows and you were passionate about this other person. Love for another person has to be maintained. And he says, love each other relentlessly. Love each other no matter what. Let that, let that be your highest law. Let that be your highest value. And then my favorite word in the whole text, he says, be hospitable. You know why I love this word? Hospitality. Hospitable. It's the Greek word philoxenos. Now let me explain that. Philoxenos. This is a fun word. Write that down. That's fun. Uh, okay. The word xenophobia comes from two Greek words. Xenos, meaning the stranger. And phobia comes from phobos, meaning fear. So xenophobia is fear of the stranger, fear of the other, fear of the person who is other than you, strange to you, who is foreign to you, right? So that's xenophobia. This is the opposite of that. Philoxenos comes from two Greek words. Xenos, which means the stranger, the other, and phile, which means brotherly love. So Philadelphia is the city of what? Brotherly love. So philoxenos is loving the stranger. Love the person who is odd. I'm looking at some of you. <laughs> I want you to know I love you. <laughs> I love you deeply. And you love me. Right? So we love the strangers, the people who are alien to us, who walk in that door and they don't believe the way we do. They don't think the way we do. They don't believe anything the way we do. Maybe they don't practice life the way we do. We love them. Philoxenos. We practice hospitality. We welcome them in and say, listen, we don't approve of everything you think, but we accept you where you are. And how much more should that be true about the believers, about the brothers and the sisters of God in the family of God? So we're hospitable to one another. She says, be agreeable. This is translated literally, uh, be without cantankerousness. Don't be cantankerous. This is the person I have to crucify every day. Who do you crucify every day? Who do you put on the cross every day? What's the old man? My old man is just a cranky, irritable person who just wants to, wants to correct everybody's theology. Right? That's me. That's the old man. That's the person I have to put on the cross every single day. And then I have to go several times a day to make sure he's still there. Right? And I got to check on him that he hasn't wriggled off. But he says, be agreeable. 
Be without a complaining spirit. Stop being irritable. Stop driving people nuts because you're an irritable, cranky person. That, that's, Peter said that. <laughs> Philippians 2, 14, he says, Paul says, do everything without complaining. In the Old Testament, now, you and I read the Old Testament story about the children of Israel, and we recognize that God judged them for their idolatry. They worshiped a false idol. Super bad on the good and bad scale. That's bad. But now go back and read that story. And I challenge you to do this. I challenge you to underline or highlight every time you see the word and they complained and they murmured. And then at the end of the story, it doesn't say because they were idol worshipers, God killed them. God says because of your incessant complaining and murmuring, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> You're dead. I'm going to leave your bodies dead in the, in the desert. That's what he says. And a new generation is going to have to inherit the promised land. God takes murmuring and complaining very seriously. You and I are to develop a godly, charitable, non-complaining spirit. That's what the Bible calls us to. In the meantime, before Christ returns in all his glory and fullness, don't be cranky. And be of service. He says, just as each of you has, has a gift, that word is charisma. Now, you may think that you don't have any natural charisma, but you have a gift from God. You have some charisma that you've been given from God. Whatever your gift... He says, do it. Serve. Now, this word serve is the same word he uses in chapter 1, uh, verse 12. When he's talking about the prophets, and what does he say about the prophets? He says, the prophets thought that they were serving you, not themselves. I love that phrase. They thought in their day that they were serving a future generation. I talked to Gene Hansen uh, last Friday. I just kind of drove in. He was spraying some of our trees. For those of you who don't know him, for those of you who are new over the last five years, Gene Hans is one of our founding members here. He is a pillar. He is part of the foundation of this church. We just kind of swap stories about our wives uh, surviving breast cancer, and then he and I swap stories about dealing with arthritis, and it was, it was just really pitiful, <laughs> like the whole conversation. But then, like, so we just sort of slapped five, and I said, hey, man, I'm praying for you, Gene. I love you. Miss you. And I drove out of the parking lot, and I did not pray for Jean. I thought about Jean. I thought about Jean and Rosemary, and I thought about the stories I've heard about them being here when the, when the concrete <laughs> that you're sitting on right now was poured. I thought about all of the service that he had given over the years, and then I started th thinking about the oars, Brennan and Leanne. I started thinking about them, and I started thanking God for Brennan and Leanne, and, all, and that old warrior has been here a long time. And he's given it all for Jesus. Then I started thinking about the Macheskis. Now I'm going to embarrass both of you. Rini and Dennis. And just the effortless service that they have given to this church all those years. And many of you, I can see you sitting in this room. I know that you have, you have left it all on the field for Christ Community Church. And you helped build the very building that we are sitting in today. This generation of people are sitting in today. And at the time, you may not have known it. At the, main, at the time, you may not have known that you were serving a future generation. But this generation and another generation is going to be blessed because what you have done. And this is what Peter is talking about. He says, serve like the prophets. Serve with the knowledge that somebody is going to be blessed by what you give to the Lord today. Let me ask you a question, very clarifying question. What am I doing? What, am, what are you doing for Christ that will outlive you? How are we serving Jesus in such a way that will outlive our service today? That's a question the Lord put to me right after I talked to Gene. And I felt convicted by it. I want to pass it on to you. What am I doing today? How am I serving Jesus in such a way that it's going to outlive my tenure? Think about that. In our world, we have become accustomed to lasting life. So I want you to listen to me. In our world, in our culture today, this is a very recent phenomenon in human history. We have become accustomed to the promise, the expectation of lasting life. If you lived in 1820, half the kids you brought into the world would die of cholera, diphtheria, smallpox, or something. And today, you and I have the expectation, a cultural expectation of lasting life. And, it's, and here's just, this is my opinion. It's very difficult for us to think about everlasting life when we have the promise of lasting life. Now, let me tell you, I'm glad for doctors. 
I'm glad for technology. I'm glad for all of that. I'm glad for vaccines. I'm glad for all those miracles, those medical miracles. I'm very thankful to God that we do live in this day. But the downside to it, the con to the pro, is that you and I don't think about everlasting life very much. Because we don't have to. Look, in the old world, if you live to the ripe old age of 40, you were an old man. I would be a very old man right now. Some of you, Methuselah man. You know? And you and I have the expectation that we will live at least into our 80s. Did you know that centenarians are on the rise? Dramatically on the rise? A centenarian is a person who lives to 100. This is a new phenomenon in the history of the world. People who live to 100. This year there will be a half a million people will live to the age of 100 or older. And the CDC and population analysts are uh, anticipating that, that by 2050... That will double. By 2050, that will double. It's very hard for you and I to think about the promise and the hope and the joy and the rejoicing that comes with the hope of everlasting life when you and I are so fixated on the promise of lasting life. Thank God for lasting life, but we need to get our eyes back on eternity. We need to intentionally get our eyes back on eternity. And this is what Peter is trying to do. He's trying to orient them and say, the end of all things is near. You live in the last days. You live in the end times. Start thinking about the next world because it's coming. And you and I are on the precipice. We're on the edge of seeing it happen. Thirdly and lastly, expect judgment. Expect judgment. Now, he has already said in the first four or five verses there that God is going to judge the ungodly. God is going to judge the wicked. God, the living and the dead, doesn't matter who you are, the living and the dead will stand before God and undergo judgment, which is an evaluation of your life in finality. But now listen to what he says, verse 16. He says, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in having that name because he suffered for that name, uh, the believer. Verse 17, for the time has come for judgments to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us, what would the outcome be for those who disobey the gospel of God? And if a righteous person is saved with difficulty, that is, if a righteous person is saved through a life of testing and trials and proving their faith to be genuine, then what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while doing what is good. So let me end with this thought. God's judgment is not only for the unbeliever. God's judgment is for the believer. And the New Testament teaches that God judges us in two ways. Now, it's very different than the unbeliever. The unbeliever has no expectation whatsoever of being saved on the day of judgment. You and I have every expectation because what Christ has done for us. Okay, you, got, you and I have every expectation of being saved. So you and I as Christians experience two categories, two categories of judgment. The first kind is what I would call temporal judgment. Temporal judgment just means in time and space. I mean, right now in this life, you and I experience a judgment that comes into our life as discipline to refine us and purify our character. Look at what he says. Well, look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty-one. 31. He says, if we were properly judging ourselves, that is, if we were living a life in which we were self-evaluating, if we were living a life in which we were judging ourselves to say, hey man, that is not the character of Christ. I need to get that straight and submit it to the Lord. He says, then we would not experience the judgment of the Lord. We would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that, here's the reason, we may not be condemned with the rest of the world. Why is God judging us? Why do judgments, temporal judgment, come, come into our lives? It comes into our lives because God is refining the character of the believer. He is making us like Christ. In addition to that, for purification. And then notice 2 Corinthians 11. So the first passage was 1 Corinthians 11. This next one is 2 Corinthians 11. Here's what he says. Verse 2 and 4. He says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, because I have promised you in marriage to one husband to present a pure bride to Christ. But I fear that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your minds may be seduced from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if a person comes and he preaches another Jesus other than the one in this book, you accept it. Or, or you receive a different spirit other than the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity poured out on the church. He says, you receive it. Or a different gospel 
other than the one that Paul says has once and for all been delivered to the saints. You receive that gospel. He says, then you do so splendidly. You do so in fine fashion and fine form. He says, but it doesn't matter about your fashion. It doesn't matter about your form. It, it matters about the content. Do you have the right Jesus? Do you have the right spirit? Do you have the right gospel? He's very clear on this. And he says, here's why God is doing it to purify you. Because God wants a refined body. God wants a purified church presented before the Lord. The book of Revelation says that he will remove every spot and every wrinkle from his bride. How do you get spots out? You wash it. How do you get the wrinkles out? Heat and pressure. That's how you get them out. He says, I'm going to present a bride before the Lord, before the Father that is without spot or wrinkle. And so Christ allows persecution into our life. Christ allows trials to buffet us. Christ allows us to go through a gauntlet of testing. Sometimes those tests are physical. Sometimes they're financial. Whatever they are, so that he can refine us and purify our devotion, purify our commitment to him. He does that. So that's what we call temporal judgment. First Peter 1 Peter 1.7, he says, So that, here's why, So that the proven character of your faith, which is more valuable than gold, which though perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, honor, and revelation at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, here's why God is doing it, to glorify himself. So that you and I can bring glory to God by being conformed to the image of Christ. The second kind or category of judgment that you and I will face is called eschatological judgment. Eschatological judgment. Temporal judgment is the kind of judgment that we face in this life in order for the Lord to discipline us, to buffet us, to train us, to test us and refine us. But eschatological judgment is the end of the world judgment. The word eschatos means end and so eschatological judgment has to do with you and I standing before Christ and giving account for our life. Romans 14.10 says, speaking uh, to Christians, Paul says this, For we will all, all stand before the judgment seat of God. You and I both will give an account for the life lived in the body. And that judgment is for reward and loss. It's for reward and loss. 2 Corinthians 5.19, he tells us, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may be rewarded, repaid for what he has done in the body, whether it was good or whether it was evil. 1 Corinthians 3.11-15, he says, For no one can lay any other foundation than the one that I already laid. The foundation is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on that foundation with gold, silver, or costly stones, great. That's the good stuff. That's what you make temples out of. Or wood, hay, or stubble, wood, hay, or thatch, that's what you make a common house out of. He said, whatever you build with, each one's work will become obvious, for the day will bring it uh, to light. Because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each man's work, each one's work. If anyone's work uh, that he has built survives, he will receive a, a reward. And if anyone's work is burned up, he will be, uh, experience loss but he himself will be saved, but only as one passing through the flames. So what does he say? You're a Christian. You're going to stand before God. Now, in context, he's talking about leaders. But in 2 Corinthians 5, he expands that to all of us. He says, you and I are going to stand before Christ, and we are going to give an account for what we have built in this life for Christ. And if you have built well, if you have lived a godly life, if your service is the kind of Christian service that outlives your life, that is selfless and sacrificial and the sacrifice of praise. And you have brought that and that's what characterizes your life. You will be rewarded for that. And if it isn't, if you have spent your life mainly for yourself, that life will go up like flash paper. And he says the person himself will be saved, but they'll have nothing to show for a life lived in Christ. Now that is Paul. And that's Peter. So what are the incentives for living a godly life in Christ? What are they? I think it's like houses and stuff. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I have no idea. When Jesus says, great is your reward in heaven, I'm not sure. But here's what I do know. You, will, you and I will have a resurrected body and we will live in a renovated cosmos. It will be actually a material world. It will be. 
And there may be positions of responsibility and authority that God has for you and his new economy that he would have had for you if you had lived according to his word. They may, there may be actual physical accoutrements. I think of my mom. I, I don't know if God is going to be giving people houses and stuff, but I think my mom is going to get a pretty big mansion. I mean, when I think of her life of just sacrificial, self-sacrificial service for the gospel, I think Sharon is going to show up in heaven. And you know, I want to be there. I want to see that. I want to see Sharon get the keys to her place, right? Like, I want to see that because my mom, her favorite thing to say is, just give me Jesus. I love that about her. She's like, I don't, I don't want nothing. I just want Jesus forever. And I'm like, I love you, mom. I want to be there the day when Jesus says, yeah, you get Jesus and here are the keys. Right? Here's, here is what I am rewarding you with for a life of selfless, sacrificial service in my name. I want to be there for that. Listen, I don't know. I think there are some incentives for living for Christ in this world right now, following Jesus Christ. Now, they're not tied to our salvation. You don't earn your salvation. You can't do anything to get salvation. But beyond salvation, Christ makes it very clear. Paul makes it very clear that God has a system of rewards that he is going to deliver to the believer. And it won't be based on grace. It'll be based on works. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourself. It is not by works, so that no one can brag. So that no one can brag and say, look at what I did to inherit eternal life. He says, no, it is not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, you are God's work. You're the work of God. The grace, the salvation in you, that's God's work, and we were created in him to do work. That's what he says in the very next verse. For a life of good works. The end of all things is at hand. How are we to live in the midst of it? Become like Christ. Do what Christ would do. Follow Jesus. Rack up for yourself accolades in heaven. Don't worry about here, okay? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you this morning. Thank you for life. Thank you for long-lasting life. God, thank you that we live in a time right now where medicine has cured so many things. Thank you that we live in a time where public hospitals are available. That is also new in the history of the world. Thank you for so many gifts of common grace for humanity. But Lord, as the believing community this morning, our eyes are fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Our eyes are fixed on Christ and the reward that he will bring us, both the salvation by faith alone and also the works that we have done in your name. And we thank you for that. And if you are sitting here this morning and you don't know Christ, now's the time. Romans chapter 10 said, is with the heart we believe and the mouth we confess and are saved. Are you willing to accept Christ's death and resurrection? His death once for you. Are you willing to accept Christ's death and resurrection? And also, are you willing to confess it? To make the good confession that it's true. To tell someone you know. To tell your pastor or small group leader or me or anybody. I decided to follow Christ today. I decided to follow Jesus. And I want to spend eternity with Christ, not eternity in hell. That's your choice today. Will you make the right one? God, we pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 